Let's give God praise tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, all the singers, musicians on the platform, all those that help and make the service run smoothly. We do appreciate your help. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, we're just going to read one verse of Scripture this evening. Hebrews 9, we're going to start reading in verse 14. There's a song, a very old song, and the title of the song is basically the chorus, I Want to Break Free. Anyone know that song? I want to break free. Uh, I knew a few of you were like, should I say it? Can we sing it in church? It's all right, it's all right. So that's a famous song, Queen sings that. And and the reason I tell you about that song is because actually that is the cry of many, many people's hearts that they want to, there's a bondage in their life. There's an addiction in their life. There's an issue, and people want to break free from this issue. And in the Bible Hour at the moment, I'm talking about getting dominion. But tonight, I want to preach about getting deliverance over addictions and over curses in life. And I believe God's going to set people free. The good news is, is that no matter what addiction, no matter what curse, no matter what bondage you feel like your life is under tonight, you can be free by the power of Jesus Christ. How many of you believe that? You say amen. amen. The blood of Jesus still has power today. It can purify us so we can serve God effectively. You can't serve God effectively under the curse and bondage of sin. So let's read our text. A simple sermon tonight titled, Free Indeed, Breaking Curses, from Hebrews 9, 14. A great verse. You should highlight this in your Bible. It says, How much more shall the blood of Christ who as the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. How much more shall the blood of Christ, uh, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Amen. We're going to have some fun this evening. God's going to deliver a lot of people. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for your word. I'm praying, Lord that you would set every captive free tonight, God, that we will come with a heart of repentance and a heart of humility, Lord, and bring deliverance, God, where there is need, God. You see those, God, that are delivered that don't even know it yet, God. I'm praying that you would speak to them. Reveal yourself this evening. Show your power that you may receive all the glory. We give you all the honor and all the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, everybody says? Amen. 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 I've got two points tonight. The first one's long, the second one's short, so you'll be okay. Firstly, let's look at the bearing of curses, the bearing of curses. And let's be honest, when I talk about curses, probably most of you thought, well, this, doesn't, this sermon doesn't apply to me, right? Because we're very Western culture at the moment. And when I talk about curses, that, that's not really, that's not, I'm not under a curse. Not many people would say to their friend, I'm under a curse, right? I don't think anyone, anyone here has usually said that. Pastor, I'm under a curse. Usually we say, I just need help with something. Right, And I know it's a curse. That's why I pray certain things. And so many times we don't understand it or we refuse to believe that there's power in curses. And so curses are very, very real. And I've seen them play out in many people's lives. Often and then over and over again. Let me give you some scriptures to back up what I'm saying. Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 28. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside for the way which I commanded you today to go after other gods which you have not known. So there's a differenti differentiation here. You're either going to go after God and be blessed, or through disobedience, not just comes, oh, I just had a hiccup. It can come a curse. Malachi 3.9 says, you are cursed with a curse, and he's talking to God's people. He says, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. We know that's talking in regards to giving to God. So they, these are true scriptures, and uh, curses are real, curses are true, and there are people under the influence of curses today. And maybe even in this room. <laughs> I know we came and see someone's like, no, not me. All right, so even in this room, there could be people suffering from a curse. So we need to define it and understand it. And the best way to understand a curse, it's the opposite of a blessing, okay? So let's look at what a blessing is, and then we'll look at what a curse is. So a blessing is a supernatural involvement of God in a human life for good. That's what a blessing is. It's a supernatural involvement of God 
in a human life for good. Blessings bring joy and they bring peace and strength and encouragement. And these are all funneled through Jesus Christ. Jesus brings the blessing and there is power in Jesus to bring us blessing and prosperity regardless of what happens in life. It's a supernatural element. It's not, oh, they're just lucky. They just got lucky that time. It's just a coincidence. No, I'm not lucky. I'm blessed. And you need to get that, that understanding because many people, they're trying to get just luck from God, but you can get much more than luck. You can get blessing and favor. A prophecy over Joseph's life, which is prophesied over our church by Pastor Theo, and we're starting to see that, is Genesis 49, 22 to 24. It says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. So he's saying that there is a blockage of a wall, but because of the blessing, it reaches over those blockages. And th those blockages can't stop the blessing. They go over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow remains in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. For there is, a, for there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. So here he is, it reaches over the wall, and then when he gets attacked, he gets hit, but he stays strong, not because he's great, because he has the blessing of the mighty hand of God of Jacob. And so that is what Joseph went through. He went through prison. He went through being a slave, through betrayal, all sorts of things, being uh, falsely accused. He went through all of that, but the blessing kept going because the curse cannot outdo the blessing of God. And no matter what happens in life, you can't outwork just to get a blessing. It is supernatural from God. The devil can throw what he wants, but if we have the blessing of God, it is supernatural help that will be available to our lives. And that's good news. So now a curse, though, is the opposite. So a curse is a supernatural involvement of the demonic in a human life for bad. All right? It's the complete opposite. Let me give you a picture here to try and give you an understanding. If you're trying to close a door and someone puts their, door, their foot there just before they close it, hopefully they've got shoes on, right? And so they put that, and it doesn't matter how hard you try and close that door, you can't shut the door. You can slam it, you can push it, but there is a blockage there. There is someone in the door stopping you from closing that door. You need to deal with the person, not the door, okay? And that person with their foot in the door, when it comes to curses, is the devil and his demonic demons. And they have a foothold on many people's lives. Let me give you some scriptures. Ephesians 4, 27 says, nor give place to the devil. Another translation, NLT, says, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. God's word says, don't give the devil an opportunity to work. And so through doors that we allow the devil in, then we can't close them because he has gained access and now he can do certain things that he was not allowed to do before because people are under a curse. This is how people get stuck. They get stuck in addictions. And they just, if I just stop, I'll just stop. I, I can stop at any time. I just, right? I just don't want to stop. No, you just can't deal with the demon at the door. And that's who you need to deal with. It's not dealing with slamming the door. It's dealing with who's at the door. No matter how hard you push, the demonic can gain access into your life. So we have to be very care of this, aware of this. Sorry. Problem is, we watch too many movies, and we think someone who's cursed, like they're around a bonfire, and they're singing himbo, humba, himbo, humba, himbo, humba, and they're wearing funny hats, and they're like cutting themselves, and like, yeah, these people are under a curse. They're the ones that, that's not how curses work. There are three types, or three ways that we can get cursed in life. Um, well, there's many ways, but i just generalize three. Number one is you can get, have a self-inflicted curse. <coughs> That is something that you have done, that you have opened the door to. And we speak, life is very spiritual. And so the reason people are under curses is because of physical things that they do. Most of our curses come this way. It's not just random. So I don't know why this is happening to me. Most of the time we do know why this is happening to me. You know, you're with me, church? We, we know, like... Proverbs 26, 2 says, like a wandering sparrow, like a flying swallow. It's like these birds are flying randomly. It says, so a curse without a cause shall not alight. So the curse has to have a cause to start up. And one of the reasons is that we open the door to the demonic in our lives. How do we do that? I'll get to that in just a moment. 
Number one is self-inflicted curses. The second way that we get cursed is through generational curses. Not something you've done, not something that you've been a part of, something your family did. Something they've been a part of in the past. And the Bible talks about being things being passed down from for the children to the children's children and the children's children's children. And these things can get cast down. Some of you, right, you're scared for your kids because of some of the stuff that you did, right? Because we understand that. It's human nature. We understand that things get passed down, and we don't want those things to be passed down. And tonight, if you're saved, we're going to break that curse. It's not going to be passed down. You don't have to worry. And so some of us, we grow up with some things, and to you, it's completely normal. It's normal for families to act like this. It's normal to struggle every week financially for the rest of your life. That's normal because that's how you grew up. But that's a curse. And when you grow up with it your whole life, you could be under a curse and not even realize it. So you have to be very careful of this. And so some people, we can see it clearly because we're not in it. So that's the second one, generational curses. And number three is cultural curses. There are certain curses that come with the culture. And every culture has a different curse uh, on, on their life. I'm obviously the foreigner in this group, right? And so every culture has their own. And when you're in the culture, you can't see it, right? Right? Because you're in it. It's, it's normal. It's, this is just life. This is how we, we live our life. But when you see another culture, you can see things a lot clearer because you're not inside of it. Because you're not part of it. Other eyes can see things much clearer than her own. And so, for example, some of you, what would be some of, the, some of the curses of the culture of Australia? Would you say pride? Would you say materialism? See all these things that are not needing God? You see how hard people are towards the gospel in Australia? So these things are very, very big in Australia. That's some of the, the, the cultural curses that come with Australia. There's much of pride and materialism. And so in New Zealand... What do you think the curse would be over here? What would be the cultural curse that we have here in New Zealand in the islands? And let me tell you, it's as clear as day. New Zealand's curse is idolatry and sexual perversion. Clear. Clear. That's exactly what it is. So you say, how, how pastor? I don't, I don't see it. Okay, let me, let me show you. Idols, idolatry. Some of the idols we have, number one, our idols, our culture. People so determined to focus on their culture. Do you see how, why do we have so many people come to a cultural night? Because people are into their culture. And again, this is, I'm not, not speaking negative of you if you've, you've done this, because many people have this as part of it. But why are so many people have cultural tattoos? Right? Because that's, that's part of the culture. Right? And so again, I, I'm not I, I'm speaking evil. If you've done that, it's fine. It's, it's, it's in the past. It, it's all good. But as Christians from now on, we don't do that sort of stuff. Do you think cutting yourself and shedding blood for a culture, do you think that is a healthy thing spiritually? Or do you think there's some sort of underlying demonic thing going on in there? You have to be very careful of these things. And that's sometimes through an open door, right? We open doors through this. Some of you, you know what happens in the islands, and we don't like to talk about it. Some scary stuff gets on in the islands. Amen. Amen. I'll amen myself. It's fine. We haven't even got into my second, my, my main parts. So firstly, it's culture, the idol of New Zealand. The second idol of New Zealand is sport. It's an idol. It's a god. More people are faithful on Saturday afternoon than they are on Sunday morning. That's, that's the life. That's New Zealand. I couldn't believe how many... Like, I, I've never gone to a, to a club game, a sports game for, through uh, school sport in Australia ever. No one came to our games. Maybe because we sucked. But no one. And I never went. It, was just, it, wasn't, it wasn't part of the culture. But over here, it's like the prestige is who do you play for? And it becomes a God. It becomes a, this is who I am. This is who I serve. And the other, the other um, idol of New Zealand is family. We put what mum says above what Jesus says. Hey, my mum said, so what? 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 Did I miss something? Like, oh, but this is what my family's doing. And so that's what I'm going to do. How come you haven't been at church or my family? 
Oh, 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 oh. How come you've been acting like, hey, I'm just looking after my family and I've got to do it? Oh, okay. Don't. Feel it tonight. Can you see? See, the foreigner knows what he's talking about from time to time, I'm telling you. And then, so idols, clearly, and there's a whole stack, but I only gave you three. And then the sec- secondly, it's sexual perversion. And how rare is it for, for families, to, kids to grow up with both parents today? It's a rarity now. And because I was talking to one of the guys actually this week and we spoke about how before, when I was in Australia, I thought Australian families were messed up. I thought, man, they've got heaps of issues. Then Pastor Elliot told me, he goes, when you go to New Zealand, it's, it's another level. I said, no, nah. no, it's not. I've seen the island families. They all love each other. They all stay at each other's houses. Like, it's like the ultimate key family. What's wrong? And I came over here. I was like, oh, despacito. Now I know what you're talking about, right? Sexual perversion in the family is, we don't talk about it. We sweep it under the rug because we don't, don't tell anyone this is our family because it's a, we're family, all right? We can do whatever we want to you, but we're family because I love you. No love at all. And it's out of control. And you know that, and I know that, and I just said it. So it's, it's not, that's not why it's true, but it's true. You know it's true. And we're going to bring it up in church. So curses are very real. Many people are under, under the curse. And so this is why many people turn to drugs, alcohol, all these sorts of things, any type of addiction. It's mainly because there's a curse played out, and they sort of sense need release. They need freedom. Okay? And curses manifest themselves financially. If, you, if you're constantly, constantly can't make ends meet every single week for the, your whole life, there's an issue. That's a curse. Because the Bible speaks about a devourer when it comes to finances. We shouldn't, we should, that's, that's not normal. But, but everyone's like that. No, they're not. That's not normal. There are seasons where you just need to make ends meet. I understand that. But if that is your life, if your whole life is, I can't afford it, that's a curse. Amen. And sometimes spiritually, have you realized how some people are very spiritually weak? They never get any dominion. Forward, back. Two steps forward, three steps back. One step forward, two steps. It's a, their whole life. Emotionally, it will affect you emotionally. If you're constantly, if you can't think straight, maybe probably because there's a curse going on. And then finally, physically, sicknesses, uh, diseases, all sorts of things. Um, some of you, you, you have the same, you, your great-grandfather's had a heart issue. Your grandfather's got a heart issue. Your dad had a heart issue, and you've got a heart issue. It's a curse. Uh, your great, uh, great auntie, she had diabetes, and now someone else had diabetes, and they had diabetes, and uh, you've got diabetes, and I, I've got diabetes, that's just part of life. No, it's a curse. They died young, so, and they died young, and everyone in my family dies young, so I'm just going to die young. It's a curse, and curses play out in all these areas. So how do we inflict ourselves? There are two main ways that we open the door. This should have been the second point, but I kept it in the first point. My apologies. Two main ways, there's, there's a million doors you can open and you can sort that out with God in your own private time. But two main doors, number one, the first door is fornication and perversion. Fornication brings a deadly curse to your life and future. It is serious. It's a girl in the Footscray Church. I was working with her boyfriend at the time. She fell pregnant. She was 16. After she gave birth, we at their house trying to catch up some fellowship. And she said, she goes, you know what's buzzy, Dan? She goes, I had a baby at 16. My mom had a baby at 16. And my grandmother had a baby at 16. I was like, eh, it's buzzy. It's a curse, man. And it just it flows down your life. That's why I'm so straight up about it. And we'll get into even more things in just a moment. Hebrews 13.4, I'll touch on this a bit at the the couple's night. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Wow, this is not Satan will judge. This is not Satan will attack. This is God will judge. God will judge. This is why so many relationships that that are birthed in fornication is that they're always arguing. You notice that? You've got those relationships in your, in your family. Why are they always arguing for? How could you always be arguing? Why are you always arguing? Then they turn violent. They turn abusive. Because it was never love. It was just lust. And you can't have a, a proper relationship based on sin and a curse. Okay? 
It's not love at all. Single people, you think mucking around that with that person won't hurt you? Don't worry. It won't hurt you. It'll just curse your life forever. No biggie. Don't worry about it. Pastor, why are you so straight up with all the time about this? Because I don't want you to curse your life. And before you got saved, we'll, we'll do with that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about now you know as a Christian. You know. Now you know. I see young ones in church all the time. I'll get on fire for God. Some of them might I just never get that fire. And I wonder why. I wonder why. They don't have the pressure of life yet, but I wonder why they never get it. And most times it comes down to sexual perversion. And singles, let me be straight up with you, and sometimes couples married, you need to repent from this. You're not just, oh yeah, that's not right. You need to repent. You need to like seriously repent from this curse. First Corinthians 6, 18 to 20, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does outside the body, he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. You're cursing your own body. If you do not know that your body was a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, who are, uh, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You don't get involved in this sort of stuff because you're God's couple came every couple that comes to me about getting married married a number of people here some of them meet and they in church or they come in they get come together uh, and then they get saved and i tell them okay whatever you did before that, fine from this moment forward you live clean if we're in the same house get another house <laughs> what 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 is that like i've got pasta i've got an excuse card you ready for my excuse card we live in the same house. Nothing I can do. Really? Because when you broke up with him for that two weeks time, you found somewhere else to stay. Oh, no, I know. We sleep in the same bed, Pastor, but, but we, just, we just look at the ceiling. <laughs> Give me a break. And every time, every time they do that, I'm telling you, every time, every time. Everyone say every time. Every time you sleep with together before you get married, the woman has dominion in the marriage. Every time. Every time. And you say every time one more time. Every time. Couple in our church got married. Told them the same thing. Same thing I tell everyone. They were having some issues very early in your marriage. If you're having issues like three months in your marriage, like, what, what the heck? It's still the honeymoon period. You don't even know what marriage is. And so they're there, and I, and like, and because because the, the wife takes dominion in the marriage, she decided just she's not going to come to church for a couple of services, and she he didn't know where she was. She just drove off and did her own thing, I'm sitting there with him. I said, "You mucked around before you got married, didn't you?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "What do you want me to do now?" You met in church. What do you want me to do? You cursed yourself. That's why, why I'm always onto social media, guys. Don't curse yourself and then come crying, Pastor, what do I do? Pray, fast, cry, sob, I don't know. As a congregation, we don't stand for that. Can you say amen? amen. We give people time when they first come into the church. You need some time. You know, maybe a month or two to, to get this right, max, two months. If you're still sleeping together after two months, maybe you're missing something. Maybe my preaching is not clear enough. And maybe you need a better minister. Maybe you should find another place. What, what Pastor? We can't just fornicate for six months and just, just repent every, in, our, in our beds before? Like, and just, like, We don't stand for that as a church. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so I wonder if you're standing with me in this area. New Zealand is sexually perverted like no tomorrow. We have the gayest parliament in the world. Literally, 11% of our parliament is homosexual. So what do you think the laws are going to be coming soon? 
You know, the next highest is not 10, not 9, not 8, it's 7. We have nearly double the next God defend New Zealand. So firstly, fornication opens the door, and I went too long, but I'll be quick now. I might not. Secondly, rebellion. If you want to open a door and get curses placed all around your life, just start being rebellious. Rebellious to God, rebellious to your leaders, rebellious to anyone that talks to you. God hates rebellion. Do you know why God hates rebellion so much? Because it ruined his house. Rebellion started with the devil in heaven. It was his house. He created heaven for him. And how dare you, Satan, start rebellion in God's house? Satan is the father of rebellion. And we know Satan wasn't always evil. He was angelic. He was awesome. He was just above. He was one of the highest ranking angels in all of heaven. But with rebellion, it doesn't matter what position you have. It's still not enough. Isaiah 14, 13 to 15, God says this about the devil. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne over the stars of God, the angels of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation in the further sides of the north. I will descend above, I ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And then God's answer is verse 15. Yeah, you shall be brought down to Sheol, which is Hades, to the lowest depths of the pit. Five times, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And God says, you will do, Jack, you will go down. Proverbs 14, uh, 17, 11, evil people are eager for rebellion, but they are severely punished. Like, why do we have to keep bringing up this, this topic? Because we are rebellious people. You could say amen to that one, we're in church, all right? It's just us, our natural inclination. Even when you were going to do something, right? Just say this water was here and I was going to move it over here, all right? Just say it's here. Someone says, can you move that water there? It's like, I was going to do it by myself anyway, but as soon as someone tells you to do it, it's like, who the heck are you? Right? It's just in us. It's inside all of us. You need to address it because if you allow that to fester, you will curse your life, man. Absalom led a rebellion against his father, ended up hanging by, by his hair, getting thrown a, a spear in his heart. Korah led a rebellion against Moses. The earth literally opened and ate him. Anyone else want to keep shy of the rebellion train? 1 Samuel 15, 23, rebellion is, the sin, is as the sin of witchcraft. That means the demonic now is in your head. The way you think is demonically influenced. That's why when you talk to people who are in rebellion, it's like they're, no one's home, man. No one's home. No, I'm all good. I don't see it. I know you don't see it because you're a rebellious little punk. You need Jesus. Break the curse off your life. So how can we be rebellious? I know it's a, you know, but through your words, through gossip, if you gossip, my friend, you are setting yourself up to be cursed. And I tell you, the people that hate gossip the most, the ones that gossip. <laughs> so funny. Do you know what so-and-so said about me? Because you do it all the time. Little hypocrite, why are you getting so upset for? I hear it all the time. Yeah, it happens. But the ones that, oh, I can't believe this. I thought this was a church. <laughs> right? It's like, you are the number one culprit. You're getting upset because that one person, what about the 10 things you've said about everyone else and they've all come to me and told me and I just sit there like, come, get upset, get upset, go, go, here's some tissues. Yeah. All right, so gossip through attitude, our eyes, our eyebrows, calm your eyebrows and actions. All right. Let's close with breaking, the breaking of the curse. That's the bearing of the curse. Let's close real quickly with breaking of the curse. And tonight, maybe you're sitting through this sermon, you're like, I have cursed my life wholeheartedly. I am done. It's like, there is hope. Hallelujah. You can be free tonight. Two ways to be free from every curse. Number one is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And listen, many of us, what we deal with our problems is what the devil says. If you just bury it, if you just bury your problem, pretend it didn't happen, or that, that issue and just pretend it never happened. Don't deal with it. That's how the devil wins. It's like weeds. If you don't pull it out from the root, what's going to happen? It's just going to grow again. If you just pull out the top so it looks all right and it's all good, it's always going to come back again. 
Brother Gunny comes past the house, and thank God for Gunny. He comes and he mows the lawns and pulls out the weeds. But recently, he's been sick of pulling out the same stupid weeds. So he got some weed uh, eater stuff, and he just, he just put it all on the weeds and then put some poison on them and sort them all out. You should see my driveway now. It's beautiful. No weeds. It's glorious. It just drives straight through. All the weed killer, it did everything, and they are all gone. It's a church. We don't need a weed killer from our life. We need a curse killer, and that curse killer is the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you pour that on that curse that's been there, whatever we've done it, inherited, generational curses, cultural curses, you pour the blood of Jesus Christ, we are set free completely. Every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus Christ, whether in heaven, whether on earth, whether under the earth. Every demon is going to have to bow the name of Jesus Christ. And so we have power. You don't have to fear what doors we've opened in the past. The blood of Jesus closes them completely and puts a padlock on them. Thank God for that. You say amen. God is good and he will help us through this. And through this verse, it gives us great encouragement. Let's put our verse up again, verse 14. And how much more through the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The whole purpose of you being free is that you can serve God properly. It's pretty hard to serve God with all these other curses going on, right? He says, I'll give you the blood of Jesus. Those deep roots will be plucked out and you can serve God with a good conscience to be like, I'm clean. Thank God, all the things of the past, they are in the past. They are washed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We can be set free from every curse that we've ever opened the door to. Hallelujah for that. So number one, it's through the blood of Jesus. And secondly, this is a bit different. You might not see this straight away, but you'll see it in a second. It's through cleansing our heart and home. So this scripture is actually talking about the Passover, okay? And talks about the blood of Jesus. And we know the story of the Passover. They came, they had to kill a lamb, they put the blood on the doorpost. And when the angel of death, the curse of death came, they saw the blood and they stopped and it passed over them, right? But God actually told them to do something else. It wasn't just have some blood on the doorpost, something very important. Exodus 12, 15, he says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. But on the first day, you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Now, this is a deep scripture. You're telling me, God's saying, if you eat bread that puffs up with leaven, get out of the camp. Get out right now. That's what, Jesus, that's what God's saying here. Cut, cut off from Israel. That's a serious statement. So, what does, why did he tell them to do that? Why did, why did he speak to him about leaven? So leaven basically is what causes bread to rise. Leaven is a picture, a sign in the Bible of sin. And he says, go through your home, get rid of all the sin that's in your home. Cleanse it. Do a spring clean in your home. No unleavened bread. So church, we need to do a bit of a spring clean of our house. Some of you, before you got saved, you had some pictures of Jesus. Get rid of your unleavened bread. His name's Sione, right? He's some random guy. That's not Jesus. Jesus lives in here. Maybe you need to check your heart for some leaven. Maybe there's some bitterness in your heart that you need to let go of. You need to check your phone for some leaven. You need to check your laptop for some leaven. You need to check your DVDs for some leaven. You need to check your music for some leaven. Do a spring clean. Get it out. As a family, I encourage every family. You need to have a family. You love family meetings? Have a family meeting. It's your moment. And as the dad, you come in and you say, all right, kids, what leaven is hiding in your room? Because we're clearing the leaven. And so you can tell me now. We'll get it sorted because then I can get it quicker. But if you don't tell me, I'll just go search the room and find it myself. You need to talk to your children. Because, listen, parents, kids can hide things so well. Remember how good we were? Nah, the kids are on another level today. <laughs> they put us to shame. We used to put it like in our sock or something. They, they know what they're doing now. They've got like secret compartments in the ceiling. They've got a whole network up there. You're going to go through phones and different folders. And I'm telling you, I'm just being honest with you. You have to. You have to check everything. Check your house for leaven. Men, you lead that. And then, when you've done that, John 8, 36, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, 
you shall be free indeed. All the curses, all the addictions, they'll be gone because you've cleaned the house and you've asked the blood of Jesus to wash you clean. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. You believe that? You say amen with me this evening? Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray.